the national director of the Congress of Racial Equality, has taken that organization and much of the black militant movement in the direction of racial separatism. In doing so, he has upset and even angered not only many white, liberal, and conservative, but also many Negroes, including Mr. Roy Wilkins, the head of the National Association for the Advancement of Colored People, with whom Mr. Innes had a while back a public and acrimonious exchange. But Mr. Innes sticks to his guns that true or urban development in America requires the separation of the races, the acceptance by the Negro community of its own burdens, and the acceptance by the white community of the idea of black autonomy. Mr. Innes was born in the Virgin Islands and came to Harlem when he was six years old, where he was schooled, he fought in the Korean War, and returned to City College of New York, where he majored in chemistry. For several years, he earned his living as a laboratory technician, but eventually his interest in the black militant movement wholly absorbed him, and now chemistry will have to wait. I should like to begin by asking Mr. Innes to examine for a moment the differences between separatism and segregation. Would you begin by outlining the obvious differences? If we are talking about a heterogeneous society, one like ours, with blacks and whites, if one of the two groups in this society controls the flow of goods and services in their own area and the area of the other people, and they control the institution, then you have a condition of segregation. So control is the key to this definition. If now, in the reverse, each of these groups in their own area, the area they predominate, control their own flow of goods and services and their own institutions so they can maximize their own interests, then you'll have a condition of separation. Condition of separation is that which you have basically between states, two political entities, each controlling their own institution, between countries, for instance. Again, another kind of political entity, between nations, in fact. We're, again, a third type of political entity. We are proposing still a new political entity to define black-white relationship, wherein each group can control their own destiny by controlling their own institutions. Uh, well, I think that's an extremely interesting definition. In fact, interesting. I've never quite heard it before, but I, I want to understand it as thoroughly as I can. Um, I don't own any stock, for instance, in uh, motor companies. Can it therefore be said that I am, to the extent that I am a buyer of automobiles, segregated? No. I think we are talking about the dynamics of a community, of a society. We're not talking about individual instruments <coughs> of it. I'm talking about the sum totals of organized ways of doing things, institutions. I'm saying that if we live in a Harlem or a Watts or a Roxbury, and you live in a Staten Island, or a queen. Why do you smile oh. when you say Staten Island? <laughs> <laughs> uh, a white part of Boston or Chicago, then clearly we live in different geographic areas, different mm -hmm. turf. And we're talking about the dynamics of these areas. Yeah. Who is going to control the vital institutions that manage and control the behavior of the individuals? Well, presumably the, 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 the people who have risen at the top of that society. But what is the racial aspect of this? Uh, if, uh, uh, if we can say, for instance, that the Rockefellers control the banking interest in New York, I, I know that's an oversimplification, but just let's just say it. To what extent does the fact that they control the banking, to, to what extent does that have racial implications? What? Uh, they, they happen to be wasps, I happen to be a Catholic, uh, other people have to be Italian, you have to be uh, 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 black. What is the racial implication of the fact that some people rather than others tend to control certain institutions? Well, first, we should never, and this is done by American social scientists all the time, we should never group black people as a total people, you know, a nation of 25 million, just about, with Irish, with Catholics, with Jews, and such. These are subgroups of an overall group called white. We, too, uh, could be considered a group with our subgroups. Now, the idea of Rockefeller controlling banks 
does not create a, a condition of segregation as such, only insofar as it's part of a pattern mm -hmm. of ownership of instruments uh, in, in the society by people of his group, the Rockefellers and other whites. Now, clearly, <coughs> such instruments are owned not only by Rockefellers, but by whites, yeah. uh, if you have to compare them with ownership by blacks. The, only com the comparison mm -hmm. between the two people, again, yeah. not so much between individuals, Okay, but um, what, I want, what I want to know is this. Uh, is it a part of your philosophy or, or of your view of the cultural situation that the color of the person who occupies an important role uh, in that society has in and of itself racial implications? For instance, is the fact that Mr. Rockefeller's skin is white, does that have a direct bearing on Harlem? The fact that Mr. Rockefeller is part of a group, yeah. a group that will control instruments, economic, social, and political, that will affect Harlem. Well, yes. Is Roy Wilkins part of that group? No, he's not. Well, now, why would he not be a part of that group, or why would he be denied membership? Uh, look, put it this way. It seems to me that anybody who drew a list of the, say, uh, 20 most influential New Yorkers would have in it Roy Wilkins. <laughs> That would be a serious error of analysis. You think so? <laughs> <laughs> Tell the truth, I wouldn't mind if they include his name, but it would be uh, a terrible mistake. Well, uh, why, why do you say that? Um, you see, I, I think we must understand the, the nature of influence and power in this country, mm -hmm. and we must understand that quite often it's expressed through plenipotentiary, but we should not for one moment assume that the plenipotentiary is the power themselves. No, I, I, I see a point, uh, but I, I, what I'm not quite succeeding in doing is uh, understanding what it is that transforms a segregation into separation. Now, if you say, well, segregation is compulsory, but separation uh, is not, that is a conventional distinction. But I think I understand you to be saying that you've got segregation if there is a coincidence between the color of a resident unit and the color of the people who dominate the economic life and institutions of that unit. Actually, you know, the definition of uh, segregation that I give is one that deals with uh, not so much biological, but socioeconomic and sociopolitical considerations. Mm -hmm. In that, I talk about the power relationship between two distinct groups. Now, clearly, blacks and whites are two distinct groups. Now, we're going to argue that point. The pragmatic effects of our existence clearly indicate that. Now, if I see certain things happening, if I measure certain parameters in the society, and if I do it through the institutions, and I notice that one group, in almost every case, control certain institutions. Institutions are key instruments of society charged with regulating one's behavior, creating values, creating norms in them, and uh, inflicting penalties, and even giving rewards. Now, if we see these instruments being in the control of one group, like schools, for instance, if we see schools, north or south, whether you have the aid of the law, the de jure segregation in the south, or the de facto in the north, wherein people live in the Harlems and the rest of New York, and schools in Harlem operate at a certain level with very poor service, and we see uh, services like sanitation, mm -hmm. clearly but being different in Harlem than the rest of New York. So that is still segregation clearly as we define it, it. Of course it is. But it would not be segregation if Harlem had its own... Its own school system. Mm -hmm. If Harlem had its own uh, sanitation system, it own, its own police service institution, uh, it would be a clearly different thing altogether. Harlem would then be operating like any healthy community wherein a natural sociological unit is converted into a natural political one, which means they control their own vital interests.
Uh, Mr. Dennis, you say that um, you consider it a healthy situation uh, when um, uh, each um, uh, uh, color group, this, this is actually what you're talking about now in New York, uh, operates its own institutions and uh, is in charge of its own economy and so on and so forth, isn't that very close to uh, a situation of, of autarky? And doesn't most progress really lie in mutual dependence, interdependence? That is true when we're talking about a homogeneous situation. We are not homogeneous with white people in America. Now, we now, why have is been that? operating, well, a pragmatic analysis will clearly indicate why. We have not been able to receive the rewards that one would receive in a homogeneous society. We have been... Do you consider that the balance of the society is homogeneous? The, the, the non-black well, society is let homogeneous? Let us put it this way. Clearly, using relative terms, they are more homogeneous with each other than they are with us. And, um, and, and, and therefore, you say that the, the crucial distinction, which in this case is, is, is color, is something that requires uh, that, that, that requires a sort of autarkic approach. You look after yourself, make your own decisions, uh, own your own industry, and so on and so forth. Move to maximize our own interests. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Now, ca can you account for the uh, fact that um, you are here very much at odds, are, are you not, with people like um, Kenneth Clark, who's no colleague of yours, I understand it. Very much at odds yeah. with him. Yeah. And uh, now, wh we wh have wh been what is the major failure of his perception? Uh, Ken Kenneth Clark, as we all know, was one of the scholars who contributed to the reasoning of the Warren Court when it um, uh, deconstitutionalized uh, compulsory segregation. Now, do you think that the nature of what he said was incorrect or simply the conclusions that he proceeded to draw from what he the said? The conclusions drawn from his own data, mm -hmm. the, the way his data was used by the Supreme Court, most important of all, the, uh, the lack of pragmatism in the past of the Supreme Court justice, both in 1954 in the Brown decision and in 1896 in the Ferguson decision. The lack of uh, a clear definition by either of these groups of wise men. In 1896 and Betsy Ferguson, uh, the talk was of things being separate and equal. The fact is that we're not talking about separate. We all know that. They were talking about segregated mm -hmm. and equal. That's a contradiction. I can agree with that. Well, what's a contradiction? And things being segregated and equal. Being things, I see, yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Things can be separate and equal, but not segregated. Well, the, the term in Plessy versus Ferguson was separate and equal, wasn't it? Right. And that was a mistake in language. Mm -hmm. Because those guys were dealing with a segregation case, mm -hmm. not a separation case. Now, the same thing is true in the 1954 Brown decision, wherein that uh, decision was contradicted. But again, these guys were dealing with a term, again, they used the word sep separate. And again, the case was brought around segregation. Mm -hmm. So clearly, in both cases, even though they contradict each other, were they were, these guys were talking about something other than separation. Now, for them, the conclusions, the inference to be drawn that the solution to segregation is integration was a faulty solution, a faulty conclusion. Because if you don't have segregation, which we all oppose, there are other ways to organize people in a heterogeneous society mm -hmm. other than integration. We nationalists say by separation. Well, do do you in fact are you do you acknowledge that you were left with a constitutional and a legal problem? As I understand it, uh, Mr. Wilkins says, look, uh, the the Supreme Court has said uh, that uh, segregation is unconstitutional because uh, it denies people equal treatment right. under the, under the law. And we know that Title VI of the Civil Rights Act, 1964, also says that no government money may be used. Uh, in any segregated situation. We agree with that 100%. Well, now, what do you want to repeal the law or what? No, I want us to use proper and precise language mm -hmm. and then draw valid conclusions. I see. In other words, you are going to attempt to persuade the courts that uh, when, for instance, students at a particular university say, we want only black students in this dormitory, that this is not, quote, segregation, that this is something else which is permissible under Title VI and under Boundaries Board of Education? Let me say that I announced that I am going to take an active part uh, 
and trying to work with students. In fact, I have started uh, my unit in Cleveland, uh, uh, right now planning a massive conference, national conference of students. Uh, I have had some conferences in New York to do something that, to, to impart some ideas and tactics, how to make demands, and to show them how sophisticated whites have been in making similar kinds of demands <laughs> without exposing their flanks. Mm -hmm. I'll give you an example. For example, if the black students and they are justified in this demand, want a situation in a dormitory similar to what many whites have now, the fraternities, the various uh, uh, Jewish or Catholic clubs, there's a way to get exactly that without uh, waving a red flag, so to say. In other words, you, you will attempt to use the arguments that are used by private organizations. Is that, is, that, is, that, is that correct? I will use the most sophisticated language to maximize mm -hmm. our interest. Well, sure, I'm sure you will. You, you're off to a good start. <laughs> the, uh, but um, wh why not be more, more direct about it uh, and ask for a repeal of Title VI? Why? Title VI doesn't bother me one bit. Well, uh, it's, it's got to, uh, as I understand it, bothered, for instance, uh, the dean of Duke University just a few weeks ago. You see, when after being visited, <laughs> when after being visited by a representative of the Justice Department's office, he repealed an agreement that he had previously made with the Black Students Union. I suppose sanity will prevail. You see, I, I, I do suppose that as we start defining more precisely what we are talking about, mm -hmm. sanity will prevail. Uh, we are talking about what? Having the management and control of instruments of uh, entities that uh, touch our lives. Mm -hmm. If dormitories are important to us, we want to have the management of control uh, of those dormitories to set the norms. Okay, the norms. okay. But would you would you exercise your control of those dormitories to exclude, let's say, a white student who I wanted find, to live there? I, I find the need to exclude anybody irrelevant, really, when I have control and management of an instrument or an institution. Well, but why, why, explain to me why it's irrelevant. If, if the black um, uh, students are prepared to uh, share quarters with some white students, and the white students are anxious to do so, why does that stand in the way of the inner philosophy? I wouldn't stop them one bit. You see, black nationalism is not a philosophy that excludes as such. It's a philosophy that seeks to move one in the direction to gain management and control of instruments to maximize their own interest. And quite often, there is no need to exclude. Mm -hmm. Now, <coughs> I am not suggesting for one moment, I want a situation wherein a majority white population can always be in a majority relationship to me. Of course not. I want to rearrange situations so that in some situations, I am the majority. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And if one of these situations becomes my dormitory, or that of my son, I will have it organized in exactly that way. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't think, uh, I don't think really, at least I'm not, not aware, that this is being opposed. Uh, is, is there a college, for instance, that refuses to allow the majority of the, uh, of the black students who occupy that particular uh, uh, college or dormitory to write their own rules even as they would be allowed if they were white students? Let me or say, is, I, is it your point that there is resistance to allowing a majority of them to come together? I think there is a resistance against black students controlling their own destiny in certain very important areas. Mm -hmm. One of them mm -hmm. is in terms of dormitory uh, arrangements. I see. Now, and not, not <coughs> to mention in terms of uh, curriculum. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I have read <coughs> that uh, in San Francisco State, uh, a black uh, freshman matriculating is accosted by a representative of the Black Students' Union and, and told that he must join, even as a, a labor union leader would tell you or me that we must join if we want to practice our profession uh, in his particular territory. Are you sympathetic with the demands being made in cases like that? Well, we are familiar in the white sector of the community. I know you learned your lesson from us. <laughs> I mean, I just, I, I hope we you, hope I hope we don't learn the bad the ones. Uh, the whole concept of close shop. Mm -hmm. And I do suppose that might be, if it is at all, and I don't <coughs> know, if it is at all, it might be an expression of the closed shop uh, mentality. Mm -hmm. My style is, and that of my organization, is that we feel that uh, our ideology is so sound that we can persuade any brother 
that it is in his best interest. And if he fails me? We will try, try again. How uh, do you try? Forcefully? With the most exquisite and persuasive rhetoric. Rhetoric. <laughs> Confined to rhetoric. Well, that's very reassuring. So that if, if Roy Wilkins Jr. matriculated at a college like this and said, I don't want to jo join a black students' union that is committed to separatism, he would not be molested, so far as you're No, concerned. not by my troops. Uh huh. And are you in control of your troops? Oh, yes. I have full control of my troops at all times. Oh, that's very reassuring. <laughs> Uh, Mr. Ennis, would you describe the, uh, the bill which the so-called so Self-Determination Act, which has been introduced into the Senate by Senator Charles Goodell, the Republican uh, senator, uh, wh 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 what is the purpose of this bill? What does it seek to achieve for you? Uh, it seeks to achieve a level of political, of economic viability that is not now present in black communities. How? by the creation of a community corporation, mm -hmm. which will be a centralized coordinating structure. A single one for the whole United States? Or no, one for each, no, each in town. black communities. Mm -hmm. uh, the definition of a community being by those individuals living there mm -hmm. themselves. Uh, the idea is to have a planning instrument, an instrument that can catalyze uh, business development, uh, Something that is missing in our areas now is some instrument that we all can relate to that uh, membership is open to every citizen mm -hmm. in our area. Uh, the bill also deals with uh, certain now, tax. You know, now, what, what would this corporation do again? Catalyze business development, mm -hmm. uh, act as a planning agency. It, it would attract uh, money for local Attract projects. money, first of all, from the community yeah. in terms of small amounts. Would it uh, accept white stocks. money? Money, as far as we're concerned, is uh, a neutral commodity, yeah. and the direction is given to it by he who has it in his hand. I see. So we will do our very best to get as much of it in our hands as possible to give it direction. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> but w w and we, we also however, feel yeah. that a lot of this money was made off of the sweat of our brows and off of our backs, and we feel we're really entitled to most of it. Oh, well, this is, yeah, this question, title is a different question. The question is how, how you want to get it. All right. Now, does your act say that uh, white people must voluntarily contribute to your corporation, or is it tax money? It seems to be a contradiction in I know, yeah, I intend to statement. That, yeah. <laughs> I uh, was rather good in logic. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you can't say that someone must voluntarily mm -hmm. <laughs> do anything. No, the bill simply talks about putting together an instrument that uh, facilitate the raising of capital in our areas. So it's not First, capitalized by the government, your well, corporation? Very to a small extent Just, uh, in, terms of, uh, in terms of uh, certain tax uh, benefits, in, certain, in, in terms of certain uh, loan guarantees, mm -hmm. uh, and in terms of a small amount of organizing money. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the, one of the important features of this bill is that it doesn't require massive government expenditures. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't uh, require massive government pump priming. Mm -hmm. it, uh, it's an instrument that uh, should move us one step forward in doing more for ourselves. Right. Okay. So then let's take a, a typical situation. Let's take uh, a Harlem. You've got this corporation. Uh, it has um, a, a, a capital of, uh, say, $100,000 a year or something, and it proceeds to go and try to $100, tempt $100,000 a year? Or what? $100 million? Well, we, we couldn't pay the rent. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, or could you stand? <laughs> well, but if, it, if it's going to be successful in attacking public money, it only has a very temporary problem, hasn't it? Well, there, there, there are several mechanisms. One, part of the bill talks about the creation of a community development banking system. Mm -hmm. Now, this system is similar to uh, a special economic instrument created for whites white farmers when they had their problem with credit. Yeah. One of our big problems being credit, we create a special instrument 
yes. that can aid in this process. Now, also true uh, from the tax benefits, some of it to attract uh, white industries to build uh, structures in our areas mm -hmm. through what we call a turnkey relationship, right. wherein after a certain number of years, they will, by contract, divest themselves of their interest, mm -hmm. and we will have an instrument mm -hmm. through which we can uh, aid or further our economic development. Mm -hmm. So that there are several uh, ways of, uh, of uh, gaining capital uh, in these, uh, through this bill. Correct. And you, you were about to enumerate other provisions of the act, yes. of the bill. There, there mm -hmm. is one other very important uh, speech, uh, bit of history I should give. The bill was first introduced by, uh, at that time, Representative Charles Goodell, joined by Widmell of Jersey, Curtis of uh, Missouri, and uh, Taft of Ohio, mm -hmm. uh, House Republicans. Uh, shortly after that, uh, the Senate version was introduced by Percy and Javits of the Republican uh, side of the aisle, uh, Illinois and New York, respectively, and uh, Nelson of Wisconsin and Harris of Oklahoma from the Democrats. And a wide range of sponsorship of conservative, moderates, liberals. Uh, we have Ed Broach and uh, one, one of the sponsors. We have John Towers of Texas, yeah. one of the uh, co sponsors. But, but Senator Harris surely would not be very sympathetic with, with you, would he? I mean, uh, well, let me suggest as, that as the no, author of the there, is, report. there is uh, no requirement for ideological agreement okay. yeah. for a bill of this sort, which is a decent instrument mm -hmm. for dealing with mm -hmm. a problem, mm -hmm. superior to most that have been offered by government. Mm -hmm. uh, an instrument that is unusual in the fact that it was proposed by black people. Yeah. It is not the usual pattern of white friends proposing for us. Right, right, right. Uh, yeah. It seems to me that ideological agreement is not necessary here. Sure. I think the uh -huh. wide range of sponsorship indicates that ideology is not a consideration. So this, this particular the effects of it. Yeah, this particular bill then does, is is not necessarily uh, committed to furthering the cause of the separation of the races. It's committed to furthering the cause of economic development yeah. in deprived areas. Oh, I see. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that's yeah. not very controversial, is it? Not at all. Yeah. Well, um, what about your your Commonwealth? Council. The Harlem Commonwealth Council is uh, one of the, the most important prototype organization for economic development in black areas. Mm -hmm. uh, it was put together uh, a group of uh, bright young leaders in Harlem, uh, led by, by me. I was the first executive director. I'm a very modest guy, <laughs> <laughs> like Bill Buckley. <laughs> uh, and I insist I'm the most modest of all. <laughs> <laughs> White guys always want the most, right? <laughs> uh, the, the council represented a good cross-section of the community, and that each of these guys had legitimately, le le legitimacy in their own right, representing some organization. Uh, we then proceeded to, uh, to make a study of the economy of Harlem, its relationship to the community outside of us, mm -hmm. and try to de design a strategy for change. Not to cure all problems, just a strategy for some change. And I think we have succeeded to a tremendous degree. Mm -hmm. Now, d did you have independent um, a faith in the success of such ideas as you have just finished describing, or do you believe that it will be impossible for them to, to deliver substantially unless they are wedded to your idea of, of separate development? I will state categorically that black people cannot maximize their development socially, economically, or politically unless we move towards the nationalist solution of separation. Now, why do you use As the, defined yeah. by me. Why do you use the word nationalist? That, that, I'm, I'm very anxious to hear you define it. Uh, why nationalist? Why nationalist? Because yeah. that has been the philosophy uh, used by all oppressed people throughout the history of mankind. You show me a people who have been oppressed, the philosophy that they migrate to, that they naturally develop, is that of nationalism. This is the same philosophy that Americans in 1770 and before developed. Well, it, uh, <laughs> it is the philosophy that Germans, French, Italians, and all people... Well, what, what, what's going on in, uh, in Nigeria is separatism, not nationalism, isn't it? Uh, 
Well, it seems I, to be a lot of I don't think we there. have enough time in this show to discuss adequately the Nigerian situation, which mm -hmm. is one not caused by our by my people, but caused by your people. Mm -hmm. you now, if you rig the situation and the colonialism, and then yeah, it point. breaks down, you know, once point. the dynamic yeah. starts, we can be blamed with the result. Sure, I see your point. I see your point. Uh, the, the, the whole business of arbitrary uh, boundaries. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, do you think that um, do you think that uh, a nationalism is better understood as ethnocentrism? Not really. I, I think nationalism is a natural development of oppressed people. Now, I make a clear distinction between people who are being oppressed by an oppressor and people who are not. Now, I cannot accept so American nationalism when they are the most powerful people in the history of mankind. The, all, all at once, yeah, yeah, it is something yeah. different mm -hmm, than mm -hmm, nationalism. Mm -hmm. But it's also true, isn't it, uh, that, uh, for instance, uh, uh, let's say the Jewish community, uh, which uh, helped, uh, uh, whose members helped each other uh, historically, Express legitimate even, even, even though they came yeah. from different nations, yeah. uh, it wasn't nationalism uh, that forged them together, was it? It was, it was something else. It was a sense of religious unity, of cultural let, let unity. Us, let us not that. use the most narrow definition of nationalism as defined by geographic... Uh, yes, but you're using boundaries. a definition I've never heard. That's why I'm no. interested. No, I, I suppose that this is not such an unusual definition at all. I think all people uh, who see a commonality uh, in, in, in their culture, in you their history, a nation. Uh, okay, yeah. view themselves as a nation. In the same sense that Elijah Muhammad calls the nation of Islam? Yes. I see. So, yes. so really, nation, you're just talking about a large community, aren't you? No, we're talking about a community of people. A people with certain uh, with a common heritage, history, uh, race quite often plays an important part. But surely, uh, you know, before you had a Germany, a bunch of wandering tribes around uh, Europe, uh, after a while, they started viewing themselves as a nation. Mm -hmm. They didn't have any real boundaries to define themselves by. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Nationhood is something that comes from within. Uh, Mr. Innes, to get back to some of the broader implications of your movement, uh, which make it arresting, you said recently, quote, uh, a recent CBS poll concluded that between 35 and 40 million white Americans are by dictionary definition racists. Uh, with those kind of statistics glaring at me, I have no intention of sitting idly by, waiting for some utopian solution to the race problem, presumably talking about uh, uh, integration as defined by uh, contemporary liberals. Now, could you give me, what is that dictionary definition on the basis of which there are 35 or 40 million white Americans who are racist? Uh, that dictionary definition deals with the, uh, the conscious component of, of racism. And I was there referring to people who uh, would admit in public or in private to having serious reservations about black people, in fact, more than that, to almost assume the superiority of whites to blacks. These are individuals that we will almost always point to in the South. And actually, let me suggest that uh, I even extend the boundaries past that 30 or 40 million. I extend it to just about every single American. Uh, because I talk about racism not just in terms of a conscious component, well, but also the unconscious component. So blacks are, of course, Americans, so you would include them. I uh, hate to admit it that uh, many blacks exhibit uh, racism. Unfortunately, it's a racism against blacks and not against whites, mm -hmm. which is rather unnatural. Well, it, it Why, of course, mm -hmm. they too mm -hmm. are affected by American institutions. The institutions are racially structured. They create values that are racist, and consequently, they too operate in the same way. Well, then, 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 then you are in effect saying that under a definition of the dictionary, everybody is a racist. Uh, I'm saying that, unfortunately, the, dic the, the dictionary definition doesn't go far enough. Yeah, I see, right. I see. But, the, but, the, but the, dic the, the uh, dictionary definition used by CBS identifies 35 to 40 million right. people uh, as racist. That's right. Now, let me ask you this. 
Is it a racist statement, as you understand it, to allege the superiority uh, in any particular, of any particular race? Unless one has uh, conclusive proof. No, no, no but, I mean, but, yeah. but I mean, I suppose there is conclusive proof. Ah, uh, sure. Of course, we would have to have a little argument about the nature of the proof. No, not if it's conclusive. Yeah. I, I study logic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, uh, if we assume it, uh, that uh, this proof is valid and conclusive, yeah, yeah. then it is not at all uh, racist, racist to... Suppose somebody says, um, the Irish have a better sense of humor than the Swedes. Is he a racist? I will say to them, you haven't seen an Irish cop lately up in Harlem. <laughs> <laughs> well, have you seen a Swedish cop in Harlem? You know, yeah. <laughs> uh, I, I, think, I think it's interesting because we're... We, we know, as, as you know, as, as a result of, of some development of the last period, of facing a problem of understanding the word racist. Now, for instance, uh, C.P. Snow says that the Jewish people, he is quite certain, are genetically more intelligent than non-Jewish people. I now, suppose, and I hope he is comparing Jews as whites with other whites. <laughs> with what, what? Jews as whites with other whites. I hope he was not comparing them with us. <laughs> you, you mean... You mean Sammy Davis? No, I'm... I'm <laughs> now, that... <laughs> that's a problem. I have a little... <laughs> no, but, but I mean, he, he made this, and he has some, some... Well, not much, but some standing as, as, as a scientist. But I, I uh, is, is this particular observation a racist observation? Because it, it was received, of course... I, I think it is, it is more uh, important... As high tribute to the Jews, yeah. but to the extent that it is a tribute to them, then it presumably reflects on people who are, who are non-Jews, right? Yeah. Uh, and... Uh, are they entitled to get very upset about this? Unless uh, Snow can give some real solid evidence. Mm -hmm. And I heard there's some guys with some serious reservations about Snow's conclusion. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> let me suggest that the important thing about racism is the pragmatic consequence, the effects yeah. of racism. You see, look, if the Greeks, while under Roman captivity, considered themselves rather educated and superior and are in fact even racist in one sense to the Romans, it has no pragmatic consequence. It means nothing to the Romans have legions mm -hmm. and the Greeks are slaves. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I, I think we must consider the effects of. Yeah. In, in other words, there, there is a sort of a platonic racism which in your judgment is harmless. Platonic? That's a strange way of putting well, it. Well, <laughs> that, that is to say, if, uh, if somebody, let's say uh, a Lithuanian, happens to believe that uh, uh, all Lithuanians are singularly uh, endowed and that non-Lithuanians are, 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 are miserable people, but he has no particular power uh, to uh, uh, codify that prejudice, then, as you say, he doesn't get in your way, right? Well, I wouldn't mm -hmm. actually lose one ounce of sleep that's over right. it. Mm -hmm. That's right. Not that's even right. an ounce. It would matter only uh, if he was in a, in a position to visit the consequences yeah. of that prejudice on you. Exactly. Now, if he becomes uh, a general in the American army, mm -hmm. especially the general charged with uh, controlling urban insurgencies, uh, or any of those things, I hear the three-star general in the Pentagon to control us in the southern. Mm -hmm. Now, I'd be very concerned about such a statement. Yeah, 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 yeah. Because of that. All right, now... Um, Granted, then, what we, have, what, ha what we have discussed, does it add up to a clear crystallization of the difference between your approach uh, and the approach of American liberals uh, to this particular problem? And is it a conceptual uh, a difference, or is it a concrete one? Concretely, how can Harlem develop into a position where you, quote, control your own schools, your own businesses, and your own lives? considering the fact that there is this interdependence. Schools, yes, that's easy enough to visualize, I suppose. <clears throat> businesses, how, how will you acquire the businesses that are now in Harlem that are currently owned by non-blacks? Let us start with the public institutions, because this is the most glaring mm -hmm. of, of, of all the, uh, the oppression. Mm -hmm. The fact that instruments that operate in our areas, presumably to give us services, are controlled by somebody else. Mm -hmm and by those who just might be rather racist. Uh, if we can get control of the schools, for instance, the, and it should be easy enough, really one, one change in law in uh, the state legislatures can take care of that. Yeah, you're in favor uh, of phasing out the Board of Education, aren't you? 
No, hear me right. Yeah. I am in favor of phasing out the Board of Education in areas that we predominate. Mm -hmm. I don't care what happens to the Board of Education mm -hmm. in the areas that other people predominate. Let mm -hmm. them decide for themselves mm -hmm. what they want. Like, I am not partic particularly for the decentralization of the schools in New York City. I consider it, in fact, a fraudulent way of dealing with the problem. I talk about, and Cole has proposed, a Harlem school system mm -hmm. that is autonomous and independent of the New York City school system. And we will want to extend that right to anybody else in New York City, even those in Staten Island, who may want to uh, control their own vital instrument of education. But don't you believe in any common standards? Only insofar as they can maximize our mutual needs. Mm -hmm. Well, would, would such a common standard be something that a Board of Education might enunciate, for instance, common standards of... Uh, well, of, of, let, uh, let me suggest that Common standards can best be uh, created when you have a homogeneous situation. Mm -hmm. It is almost never possible when you have a heterogeneous one. Uh, Mr. Greenfield. You were talking earlier about, about community development. In the Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, there's a uh, major effort, I'm sure you're familiar with it, which, in which there is a restoration corporation, almost all black, in which the blacks make basic planning decisions about the kinds of things they want in their neighborhood. And then there's what they call a development and services corporation, composed of, of some of the biggest industrial leaders of America, all white and the white leadership gives money, technical services, and the blacks control the way it's used. Does that strike you as a, as a promising road to cooperation? If it is as you describe it, and I'm not certain it is, let's assume I haven't moment. studied it that sure. carefully, but let's assume it is so, I will say that's an excellent way to have cooperation. Ms. Hartman. It's been said that you've said that the question of anti-Semitism amongst black people is irrelevant. Yes. Could you explain that? Because anti-Semitism is a historic, historical <coughs> phenomenon, one with a long legacy. Black people and Jews have not been in contact that long for us to develop that kind of a legacy. Now, what people see as some irritation and justifiable, we so, irritation on the part of blacks to certain exploitation by certain Jews could not be considered uh, anti-Semitism. Now, anti-Semitism is a Euro European phenomenon and one that was transmitted to its progeny, the Americans, that we should not be blamed with. That's a fight among uh, whites and let them deal with that. You're talking about anti-Semitism as though it were a Dutch Elm disease or something. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it, in fact, it, 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 you can whip up a pretty good case of anti-Semitism in 400 years. So I, I don't think that fully answers Ms. Hartman's questions. Uh, well, uh, it, it, it's perfectly possible. I'm glad you said 400 years because we haven't know. been together with Jews in the same kind of relationship we have now in these ghettos for 400 years. In fact, it's uh, less than 100 years, if that much. Is it your point that, uh, that, uh, <coughs> that you can't have anti-Semitism develop in the course of 100 years? It is my feeling that that phenomenon that we refer to as anti-Semitism, that one which aroused such feelings in the Jewish community, such uh, uh, paranoia, in fact, in the Jewish community, overreaction in the Jewish community, is not something you can develop in 100 years, but something that has a legacy that you have to go right back to Europe to find. Well, I think you're intellectualizing my question, which is um, simply, I think that uh, the question of anti-Semitism has created a great deal of disturbance in all communities, because I think that um, it is something that's very pertinent to the right yeah. well, let's, of let's people to live together without... Let's go back to the, 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 the thoughts I had on, uh, on, on racism. Me. 
Let's consider again the pragmatic consequences of something. All right? First of all, I cannot accept that the, what you see as an antagonism between blacks and Jews, uh, blacks trying to gain rightful control and management of their institutions, can be considered anti-Semitism. And I think if you consider again the pragmatic consequences, which ones of the groups in America can really have uh, pragmatic anti-Semitism? Blacks or Anglo-Saxons? Blacks or other whites? <coughs> Uh, well, what, Jews. what do you what think, think that anti-Semitism is? Blacks as a powerless people in the United States, that Jews should not be looking at us as their enemy. The enemy is the guy with power. And clearly, we don't have it. Well, could you define what you think anti-Semitism is? Anti-Semitism is different that things. Social, social pathology. I almost said social disease. Well, that means something else. Uh, a, a social pathology that uh, nurtured in Europe as expressed by the Germans and I heard that the Russians had some of it and the Poles and just about all the other white groups in Europe and transferred to the progenies of the Europeans, the Americans that we see developed and nurtured in this country over the, the existence of it something that is white, not black. But if, if there has been in the black community a great deal of insulting remarks against People the Jews... People insult each other all the time, uh, the last time I heard. Uh, <laughs> you know, that doesn't make one an anti-Semite. You know, if I call a Jewish guy a name, it doesn't make me an anti-Semite. The fact is, he calls me all kinds of names. Does he become anti-black in the process? He insults my leaders? He, 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 he insults the so-called separatists, the black nationalists. He insults Nkrumah. He, he, he insults Sekuturi. Now, now, wait a minute. Now, wait a minute. That doesn't make him necessarily anti-Negro. Exactly. <coughs> it, doesn't, it doesn't make him anti-Negro. I am saying that we demand the same rights. Now, if we can have whites, including you, yeah. insulting certain blacks, making harsh statements about blacks and black leaders and black countries, it doesn't we too reserve the right to do the same thing for Israel as a political state, and to Jewish leaders, and to individual Jews. Mr. Doctor. In uh, discussing uh, your supposition of separation about the group controlling the interests of the area, uh, let's say majority rule, and... Uh, Very American concept, isn't it? Yeah. Yes. Uh, but I see, I'm, I'm concerned about what is to decide the predominance, uh, let's say spiritual rather than racial. For example, I would say that Professor Henry Pagliucci in War, Peace, and the Presidency uh, his concern for nationalism and the fact that he lives on the Upper West Side would have more in common with you, let's say, than Roy Wilkins or John Lindsay if political circumstances would cause him to turn black. But uh, I would say he would have more in common with you than, uh, let's say, many moderate so-called Negro leaders. I have much more with Brother Wilkins than you really think. Let me tell you, I don't care how close Pelucci comes to me, I have a lot more Brother Wilkins, even though we differ ideologically. I'm, well, I'm willing yeah. to have him yeah. come back home well, and I'll do all I can to yeah, bring but him no, Isn't that a racist question, statement? Though, this doesn't answer my question. It's not. It's a very pragmatic one. It's one that recognizes what that <clears throat> exists in the United States. Does, that we does exist it, as two color, distinct people. Does the color of my skin, let's say, prevent me from, jo from becoming a resident of your community? Or no. is it just a spiritual... Uh, as as the, uh, the fact that you're an American doesn't prevent you from living in Canada. Yeah. Or the fact that uh, a Frenchman can live in, in Germany. The logic student, that's a bad analogy. <laughs> Why is it a bad analogy? You, 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 your point is that you will not receive him as your brother. No, in a very strict sense, that my you, brother you, is a you, black. You consider him in, in, in why? Because, because that's what it is pragmatically. It, it doesn't mean that I'm going to hate the guy. It doesn't mean I'm going to bar him from my community. Of course not. Why? It's totally irrelevant if I control my own community. In <laughs> fact, I can see situations wherein I welcome you <laughs> to... Uh, <laughs> You got that so much Jeremy. imagination, right? <laughs> imagination. <laughs> <laughs> Miss Greenfield. Well, You're looking very glum, by the way. Well, yeah, I, uh, uh, It could be worse. <laughs> no, the reason I am looking glum, frankly, is, is, is because of the converse side of that. And, and that is, uh, there's, a, there's a sense in which it, it does sound that, that as though underlying what you're talking about, about economic development, with which I have no quarrel, there is a sense in which you seem to have adopted the sense that, that race has, has made you 
uh, define the boundaries of your community. It's almost as though all the sickness of, white, of what white society has done to black Americans has forced you into a position where you, in self-defense, are defining your community in racial terms. That's Ken kind of Clark's thesis. <laughs> it's not mine. Well, but now that's what interests uh, me. It sounds let, like that's what you're no, saying. No, it's not so at all. Maybe I should use the words uh, faction. This is the word used by one of your fundamental fathers, James Madison, one of the brighter ones. Uh, <laughs> but not he, he, he talked about mm. faction, special sure. interest groups. Sure. You know, living in society and, you know, talking about them uh, being able to maximize their own interests and government being an instrument to stand between them and all that kind of business. We are using the same kind of concept. We are saying that we are a faction. There are two main factions in America, blacks and whites, special interest groups. We are not for one moment suggesting that you don't have sub-factions among the factions. Of course you do. No, but, but there's no way clearly, that they link up. From any pragmatic analysis, even by a man from Mars, clearly you'll see two factions in America, blacks and whites. You can define them in terms sure. of the pragmatic effects of our living together. Sure, that's now, what I said. If that is so, I then want to organize oh. these two people in a way so we can maximize our interests. That's all. Now, it happens that we would end up being mostly black, but that's the nature of the game. We live in old black communities now. It sounds like it's Whitey's game you're playing. No. Because you're giving all. him the biggest piece of the pie. For the first time, he's got all the pie now. No. And no. I'm getting back yeah. my piece of the pie. Uh, all right. That's the difference. But that's Whitey's game, isn't it? I mean, that's a white, that's exactly, it seems to me, what a, what a white man no. not no. interested Whitey's in black community would exactly want to do. Let me exactly what Whitey's game is. Whitey's game is to take all the pie. <laughs> <laughs> now, we haven't moved there yet. We've got to talk about our piece of the pie. Which uh, white are you talking about? Those that uh, built this uh, massive empire that became so good at protecting uh, Plymouth Rock that they soon start protecting all 13 colonies and eventually having this thing called Manifest Destiny and protecting the whole piece of the action from Atlantic to Pacific. You know, that white yeah, now wait, and the one that it extends and starts yeah. protecting the rest of the world. Yeah, but just, just, just for the record, I don't think we ought to go off the air without it being observed uh, that uh, during the past uh, 100 years, during the past 10 years, during the past five years, a much larger slice of the pie has gone to the black community. And I don't know any whiteies who resent this or are sorry about it, but I know an awful lot who are very pleased about it. One measure of the pie is something like $860 billion dollars. We represent at least 12.5% of the population by our country, more like 15. Do you suppose that our part of the GNP is anywhere close to that percentage? It is approaching it. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you.